This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. When we're on and today's <laughs> guest will be Chris Spry. How are you, Christopher? I'm very good, mate. How are you? Yeah, really good, mate. First and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. Mad story, very dark. Some dubbed this woman Britain's most evil mother. You went through some torment, some torture, some pain, some misery. She ended up going to prison, rightfully so. But today's all about you and go through your story and your journey, how you overcome it and the things that you're doing now. It's it's unbelievable how people can grow some inner strength to then still kick on in life, even though all the dark stuff they go through. First and foremost, how are you? Overall, I can't complain. Like, you know, I, I've, I survived that. <laughs> that's that's the main thing. Like, I, I can't complain. Um, you know, you have your shit days, you have your good days. Like, um, I can't complain. Yeah. Can if, I just ask one question? Yeah, of course. Are we okay with swearing? Let's do what we want. Yeah, we yeah. We can you, do what we want, mate. It's I don't know if you get demonetized. No, no, we do, but... I, we just got to keep it real. Yeah. So we do get demonetized with the swear words, but fuck it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That sounds it. <laughs> but before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start with my guests. Where you grew up, how it all began. So, um, my I was born in Cheltenham, 1988. Well, we think. I don't have a birth certificate, so <laughs> I don't actually know when I was born, which is a rare thing to have. But we believe I was born in 1998. Uh, my parents were they had substance abuse issues really badly. So like my earliest memories of uh, uh, tottering around a house with no carpets, no like paint peeling off the walls. It was, it was a shit situation from the start. And like my, my first memory ever is literally eating a sugar sandwich. Cause that's what we had in the cupboard. Um, so yeah, by the age of three, um, my parents were looking at putting us up for adoption and my mum ended up going into hospital nearly dying because she was taking heroin while also uh, she had, uh, I think it was pneumonia or something. Anyway, she nearly ended up dying. Um, and through some friends, she found out about Eunice Spry, who was offering private fostering arrangements. And that started the the journey of craziness. Yeah, like I've read your story and I've watched some of your videos, some dark stuff. And now that you're a father and I'm a father, listen, kids are pains in the asses, but yeah. the stuff that you went through does not d deserve any of that, any sort of abuse or pain that kids should suffer because kids are pure, they're in this earth. Kids don't ask to be born. Nah. And that's the sad thing. So for people to abuse them and abandon them, it's, it's heartbreaking. When did, what was it like? What was it, first steps to go to, is it Eunice? Yeah, Eunice. Eunice, um, Eunice. So initially it was really exciting. So I'm like three or four years old. I remember she had this bright yellow freaking Volvo. It was, it was amazing as a little kid. And we arrived at her house and it was like a dreamland, mate. There was um, toys everywhere, like her sand pits in the garden. Her garden was massive. And initially everything was amazing. 
literally. She, she was strict. She was Jehovah's Witness, um, and they tend to be a bit strict to the most parents. Um, but it wasn't abuse at first. Uh, if anything, we had a great first six months. And then we it went wrong. <laughs> it went very wrong. Yeah, so see the first six months, was it loving, was it caring, was it cuddles, or was it just you were, they were leaving you alone? I, I wouldn't say it was loving, mm-hmm. but it, we were taken care of well. It, it was it was like being in a foster home, really. Like there's there's no real love there. But it you know, we had clothes on our backs, we had food, we had like toys to play with, so um and we went to church three times a week. It was all right. <laughs> How many kids in the house? Uh mm. so there were five kids in total. So uh Charlotte, uh who died in a car crash later on, we'll get into uh Charlotte, Victoria, and Aloma, my real sister, and my real brother, Caleb. So she had two of her own and three foster? Yeah. Well, well, no. Uh, Charlotte uh, was adopted as well. So she had two of her own kids, but they were way older. So we very rarely saw them. Mm -hmm. But all five of us kids were adopted, fostered, something. Were you all kept in the same room? Uh, so me, Victoria and Alomba were in bunk beds in the same room. Yeah. It's mm. chaos. <laughs> That's a chaos. When did you see the first change? So this is it. Cause everyone asked me like, um, was it a gradual thing? And no, th- this went from zero to fucked up in like one night. And I, I call it the crossing the line instant. Um, do you want me to go into it? Of course. Cool. Um, it's, it's fucked up now because like, I've got a toddler, mate. <laughs> I'm sat there thinking, as I'm recreating this in my mind, I think of my own toddler there. I guess fucked up with the head. Um, so the crossing the line incident, we were, some chocolate went missing in the house and it just triggered something in her. I've never seen her like that. And she came around really angrily asking us, like, who took the chocolate? Who took the chocolate? And no one had taken the chocolate. So she got three of us, Aloma, Victoria, and myself, and stood us in like a little semicircle. And she asked us to take our shoes and socks off. And like, that's weird, but we did it. She asked us like really up in our face, like straight away, who took the chocolate? Who took the chocolate? We all said no. And then she very slowly walked to the corner of the room, picked up a chair leg, a gnarly old chair leg that the dog used to chew. And she just came over and whacked the tops of all of our feet slowly. Now, we're not talking like a little love tap. Um, she, it was a proper assault. <laughs> and that's the first time I've ever felt pain like. And you know, I'm probably four and a half, coming up five years old. And yeah, we all dropped to the floor like a total shock. And she stood us all up who took the chocolate at this point we're crying our eyes out and none of us knew who took the chocolate she started again and this went on for what seemed like days but it was probably like 20 minutes and eventually i think it was victoria admitted to taking the chocolate even though she didn't uh, just to stop it happening and yeah that was pretty fucked up situation who did take the chocolate no one took the chocolate. It was found in the garden with the dog. So that whole thing had been fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> so is that when it was, was it an everyday occurrence after that, or did you get breaks? Um. So that was that started a chain of events very quickly. Um. Like even from that night onwards, it the discipline amped up. Um, I'd say within a month we were getting beaten daily or she was obsessed with like Japanese torture and stuff. So within a month we were running up and down stairs all night until one of us collapsed and then we could all go to bed and um, make us do like invisible chairs against the wall. And yeah, it's pretty fucked up shit. <laughs> how was she, how did she be so fascinated with Chinese torture? So, we late we later found like books of um what the Japanese had done to the Chinese in World War Two and she was she must have become obsessed with it because 
um she was like writing notes in the books and stuff and it, it was messed up stuff and you know everything she could do which didn't leave us with physical scars too much she would do like you know from drowning to you know sleep deprivation to eventually not feeding us and yeah what was the house like so the house this was the house in chooksbury and it was all right it was um after a while we ended up becoming like her i want to say slaves almost because we would clean the house you know cook the food um take care of the younger brother like she was kind of treated like a queen so the house was all right it was when we later moved into the farmhouse that uh like we really started she well she lost the plot to be honest was there a man a room a father there like stepdad then anywhere that we seen just her just her just her there sometimes her ex-husband would come onto the scene but it's like a handful of times literally what about social services did they ever appear so we had one or two visits from social um but they were literally just door knocks and she'd parade us all out and we were all okay and that was it you know i later came out to find and especially in the serious case review afterwards loads of people had complained but because of um her being a jehovah's witness it was uh deemed awkward for them to deal with so they just left her alone yeah i think is it the amish community or i watched a documentary because of their own certain beliefs they can be left alone and do more cruel things to kids yeah there should be one law for kids protect kids anyone harms a kid straight to prison yeah anyone sexually abuses a kid bullet in the head yeah that's that that's my philosophy of it if i become prime minister that's the two things i'm changing so you probably shouldn't become prime minister <laughs> <laughs> country would be one very different <laughs> see when um was there any neighbors at the house or was it a free-for-all where so they could hear your screams and pain so in the chooksbury house we did have neighbors um both sides it was like a just a i want to say a council estate but it was quite a nice council estate um i've lived to some bad ones since <laughs> But uh, it was later on when we were in the farmhouse, like from age six onwards, that was in the middle of nowhere. Nearest neighbour was, you know, 20 acres away. Um, like, she could have killed us and got away with it. Mm -hmm. And she probably tried quite a few times. When, how long did she starve you for? So the worst starving, um, my sister Victoria and I were locked in a room and we can't quite remember the exact times, but it was, we'd get a slice of bread a week type thing. Um, we'd get water every two days. Um, we literally were in a room with just a bed frame and uh, floorboards. Uh, that was it. And a nice window. Um, you know, I ate rat droppings to get me through that. Um, the room was infested with rats, so like it's fucked up, mate. Really fucked up shit. Um I ate my sister's vomit. Yeah. It's like pretty fucked up. Like I'm looking at I look at it now and I, I honestly think, how the fuck did we survive that? Especially that one incident where we locked up. Um I think we only survived that because her her parents arrived and wanted to see all the kids, so we ended up having to come down and have a meal. Um, but initially, she'd put that meal in the room with us. She told her grandparents, her parents, that we were being naughty, so we were locked in the bedroom. And she put the meal in the room and said, if any of us touch it, we'll, she'll end us. So we were starved for like a couple of weeks looking at this roast dinner sat there. And that does weird things to you, man. Um, as you can see, I've made up for it since. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've had all the food now. Um, but like when your your brain starts doing really weird shit when you've been denied food for a long time. And like we were contemplating jumping out the window and actually opened the window, but it only opened this much so we couldn't fit through. Like, 
what is going through the mind of an eight-year-old like when you're actually considering jumping out of a window because that's a better option than staying in the house? It's mad. What were you think? Look, it's hard to remember and think as such a baby is seven and eight, not fully developed, but was it normalised in your mind where you actually just accepted it or did you know deep inside, I need to get out of here or were you just accepting that maybe that's the way every kid get treated or did you know that was wrong? So for us, there was two sides of it, especially when we were younger. She would um, tell us that this was God's doing and genuinely we believed that initially. Like we were the devil's children. She, we'd been put in her care to rid us of demons. So initially, like I would pray every night. I'd sit there praying like, that the devil would leave me so that we could go back to living a happy life again. And uh, I remember praying to God and thanking him for putting me in her care. Like, so initially we, we were like properly, we were in her, um, in her control. It was when probably 10, 11 years old that we really started like getting the thought that actually this, this shit ain't right. <laughs> and, you know, I guess, but she was our mum. Like, you do some, you, you know, turn the world over for your mum, wouldn't you? Like, so even when we late teens, when, you know, we knew it was wrong, we would have still supported it. Even when this all came out, the police had to really work with us to get us to actually cooperate with their investigation because we were going to protect her right into the courts. That's crazy, that. Like, yeah. Going to protect a woman who was beating you up, starving yeah. and drowning. I had, my first police interview afterwards was actually, I just told them that the whole thing was made up and um, that, you know, she was a, uh, an amazing mum, that she only smacked us once or twice and I literally went on the record in an interview and said that, which is, I look back now and I'm like, fucking hell. What? But fear and manipulation is a very powerful yeah. tool. Especially yeah. using against kids if they believe that it's normalized. Yeah. And that's the sad thing. Like, there's so many people, not just kids, but adults who are in those relationships where they don't know how to get out. They're Absolutely. So fearful. Absolutely. Do you know what I mean? So, see, when you're going through all that, look, what sort of. She used to drown you as well? Yeah. So, the thing is, she had this thing. Do you want to wait for that? Or? No, I just let it. That's perfect timing, <laughs> mate, for her. <laughs> welcome to london <laughs> she had this thing where she needed us to be shocked by what she was doing so the daily beatings she'd have us lie on the floor feet up in the air and she'd beat the bottom of our souls she used to be a nurse so she knew what parts would bruise and what parts would scar for life um so you know don't get me wrong we've got enough scars but if she'd have done it on our backs and stuff, we'd have been, it would have been noticed. Um, so after a while, I could sit there and take a beating over my feet for like 20 minutes and not be bothered almost. Don't get me wrong, it hurt, but that shock wasn't there anymore. So this would literally send her crazy. So she would have to find the next thing to, you know, raise the stakes even more. So... Um, that was drowning. And we, this old farmhouse had this big like porcelain roll top bath, I think they call them now. Um, this was before they were cool. <laughs> and like we would be full bath. She'd push us in there. And the Jehovah's Witnesses have got this thing where they, when you get baptized, like in the name of the Lord. So she, she said this was, her, you know, her washing off the devil off us. And she'd hold us under. And there's a point where you're underwater where you have to let go of the air. And she would wait 20, 30 seconds after that. And yeah, the amount of times she probably got close to killing me doing that. But no. Did you never just pretend to scream just to satisfy her? Yeah. Init initially, yes. And it worked for a while. It did work for a while. We'd play the victim. Well, we were the victims. Yeah. <laughs> but we we would, like, play up to get out of the beating sooner. 
and then she realized what we're doing also there there was a time afterwards where actually there was a bit of defiance in us where we'd be like well what's the best you can do then like um but that backfired really badly because then she we went through a stage where she just did crazy shit like putting our hands on like burners of cookers uh, we had a like a rayburn it's like a big stove with a like, fire pit underneath it and it had this solid metal cooker top on which was always hot and as you're walking past she just grabbed your hand and put it on there for two seconds and it was like it was about shocking us at that point or we'd be sat asleep and she'd suddenly hit you across the back of the head with a baseball bat or something um like i think my work one of my most fucked up memories is i'm pretty sure i died I'm pretty sure i died um was in old farmhouses you have sash windows inside those sash windows there's these big lead weights that hold the window lets it go up and down and i got hit across the back of the head with one of those and we're talking five kilos probably solid lump of metal and i blacked out and i just remember just peace mate I, I, that was the happiest i've ever felt it was fucking lovely and i'm pretty sure i was out gone and i woke up to my um my sister aloma basically bringing me round and that started off a thing where actually we ended up taking care of each other's injuries and you know she would break bones we'd end up with a broken arm so you'd get two pieces of bane entwined tie your arm up <laughs> life had to go on we ran a farm <laughs> like the farm had to still work mm -hmm. no schooling or anything nothing she homeschooling she ho um so we went to school for a few days at the start yeah at the start uh, while we're in, still in Chicksbury and it quite obviously quite quickly got noticed that we had bruises on us um we're literally talking less than a week um and also we she just started doing the food starving. So I suddenly see a string of lunch boxes filled with food. So I, I fucking help myself, mate. <laughs> it's great. These people bring food. Great. Um, and teachers noticed that quite quickly that someone was sat in the corner with a hundred sandwiches, trying to chow down. Um, they must have reported that. I, I don't know what happened in the background, but they must have reported it because the day ne the next day, all of us got taken out of our separate schools and suddenly were home taught. Was that her plan to take you to a farmhouse where she could get away with the torture and abuse? I, I think a lot of things added up well for her. So the farmhouse was owned by this old chap called John Drake, who was, he was on his last legs. He had really, I think he had lung cancer. And suddenly Eunice stepped in to help him um, take care of him in his last days. He just happened to own a lot of land and this amazing farmhouse. And a couple of days before his death, um, he suddenly changed his will and left everything to Eunice's daughter. Um, and then he died all of a sudden from his oxygen rang out. So could she have killed him? Oh, I, 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 I hundred percent believe she did. Hundred percent believe she did. Um, you know, his oxygen didn't get turned on that night, so he, he stepped with like this nebulizer thing on, and he forgot to turn it on. Yeah, I, I, I think she ended it. Really fucking weird. That night, she paraded us all in front of him as he was dead, and to show our respects. So there's this old man hunched up in a chair and dead it was really yeah well, one in the morning you've got moonlight coming through the window it was scary mate <laughs> like, six years old seeing you a dead person and she just made us watch him for 20 minutes like what a fucking psycho <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like, crazy go now when i was telling this story to the police initially i told it them excitedly Oh yeah, we saw this dead person. And I, now I look back as an adult, 
<laughs> yeah, it's mad. <laughs> Listen, if people pass away, grandparents or family members, and you're a kid, they're in the coffin, you go for a two minutes with your family, you pay respects, but you're not sitting there saying, look at that dead body. Was that to scare you that that's the way you could have been? Or was there any tactics behind uh, that? I, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it definitely freaked us out. Mm-hmm. It definitely freaked us out. Um, but suddenly, she was suddenly, you know, given this farmhouse away from everyone. And, you know, no one was there to watch for scars. No one was there to watch for beatings or bruises or whatever. So suddenly it was like the greatest gift ever for her. Did she le- Because it says that she left her other daughters, never touched them. Is that correct? Her real daughters? Uh, so, um, How true is that? So her two real daughters, I think they had a, a general Jehovah's Witness upbringing, which was probably fucking weird but not torture weird yeah yeah um shut but this is where it gets even fucking weirder so charlotte the eldest out of us five and my younger brother were never touched in fact they went through the total opposite where they were given everything you know and almost to a stupid level. Like my young brother was not allowed to tie his own shoelaces. He was not allowed to get himself dressed. We had to do all that for him. It was almost as if he was like royalty, like Lord Fontoy or something. I don't know. <laughs> like, um, which has fucked him up now though, because like when we came into modern care, he didn't know how to wipe his own ass, literally. Because we don't, we had to even go to that level. He couldn't tie his shoelaces. He couldn't even like get dressed on his own. And he must have seen some of this all going on. And you know, we dealt with the police very early and said, actually, we we will help you with your investigation, but leave him alone, like because we knew it was going to fuck him up even more. Mm-hmm. So he's never really told his story, which is kind of sad in some ways, but. Yeah, when did she tie you to the car and start driving around? That was so it's hard to pin down certain years, but I'd have been 10, 11 years old. And again, we were at that point where nothing was scaring us anymore. So, you know, even from like swallowing TCP and stuff every day, and like we were just getting used to it. So I can't remember what caused it. Um, and I thought I remembered, but then my sister told me I was wrong. It was something else. But anyway, something drove her mad. And a few times she had tied me to the car and then I would follow the car. And that's fine. You'd walk behind the car and it was to tire us out or, I don't know, show intimidation. I don't know. This time she'd attached it to my foot and she just gunned it. And it was a big v8 transit van so it went and it was a small farmer's trail alongside a freshly plowed field with you know furrows in it and and i remember all i can remember from it to be honest is hitting that first furrow and thinking shit this gonna hurt and from that on i can't really remember it um like my sister's described to me, she probably drove a couple hundred meters and then just undid the rope and walked off. And my sisters ended up like having to put me back together. How was it seeing your sisters getting beaten up? Hard. Because we had become a really tight threesome and we would volunteer to take beatings. I could probably take a bit more physical punishment than them they definitely took a lot more mental punishment, like the humiliation, that type of stuff. Um, so I would volunteer, like I would own up to taking food um, to deal with the beatings more. But sometimes she'd put us all in the same room and to watch another person get beaten. And there's two sides to it. One, you're desperately sorry for them. And two, also, you know, it's fucking coming around for you in a second. Like, and you try and act brave for each other, but you, there's only so much you can do. Right. Did you ever think about killing her? 
Are you too scared? In the late later years, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of shotguns on the farm. Could have done it. There were times where... There were a couple of times where she would swing for me and I'd grab whatever implement she had. You know, the one day it was a hammer and I just grabbed it. You know, we were teens at this point and she was getting older. And for about half a second in my head, I was like, right, fuck this. And then she, I don't know. We just didn't have it in us. Didn't, you know. Yeah. A fear. mixture of fear and also she she was our mum. Why do you always refer her to your mum? Well, I, I don't anymore. I don't anymore. But Why did the, you keep her name? Um, it, It's tricky because of legal reasons mainly. Um, So to protect other identities in this case, which uh, I had to use that name legally. Mm-hmm. So there will be a time where actually... I stopped telling this story and we're probably close to that time now. We're probably close to that time, especially as I've become a dad and I'm very much on my own path now away from hers. Even though once in a while they do, our paths still touch. I actually saw her quite recently in a petrol station, which freaked me the fuck out. Um, but you know, it, it will be time soon to put that chapter to sleep. And stop all the act of, you know, stop all the helping others and running charities and stuff, put all that to sleep and actually just concentrate on my own life. Um, but that's really hard to do. Yeah. That's might be a weird question, but did you love her or do you still part of your love her? Like, is it, I know it's weird, but it's hard with that, like Stockholm syndrome kind yeah, of mentality. We, so it's just to try and understand it. All three a, of us were told afterwards we had Stockholm quite badly um and initially yeah initially we we still love doing it It, it's very hard going to court against someone you love (laughs) or have a lot of care for and but that went away from me when she said it was all made up even though the police had literally a van's worth of evidence, literally a van. They'd put cameras down our throats to see all the scars internally where she'd shoved knives and shit into us. Um, you know, there was so much evidence, you know, and the fact we'd have been put through hell to get that evidence and then for her to still say, no, they're making it up, that for me was the triggering point. But that's an ultimate psychopath and narcissistic yeah. nutcase where... She would always blame you. You've got yeah. a knife in your throat. She's done it. It's your fault. Yeah. It's and whether she truly believed it or... Did she get psychiatric reports? So the police took the quite rare step to actually test if she had mental issues. Um, oh, yeah, she's psycho. If she, you know, if she had issues. Normally the defence do that. <laughs> but the police actually took the steps to do that and they gave her a clean bill of health uh, in the report that she just, uh, it actually says she had evil tendencies. Is that no psychotic then? Having evil tendencies (laughs) and harming kids. I don't even think you need reports to understand what you actually went through. For me, she's a nutcase and an out and out loon ball who is just pure evil to the core. I think some people are just pure evil. Mm -hmm. Uh, And whether that's caused via, you know, a character or actual, an actual mental health issue. Fuck knows. <laughs> yeah, well, it's weird because people who kill, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a psychopath. Sarah Sands, who I love to bits, she killed her son's abuser. Mm. An amazing woman. Nothing but, she's a hero in my eyes. So if you looked at another killer. Did she do time for that? Or? Seven years. They, they doubled her sentence. Yeah. So, and that takes courage. Because as a, you know, you're a dad, yeah. I'm a dad, I would. Do the same. You've been I, through it. You're doing everything to protect your kids. Yeah. How, what was the worst beating you ever had? Did she ever get the gun out to you or anything? No, no. She, she was that. very anti-gun. Very anti-gun. The shotguns were on the farm from the old man. So I don't know why she, she never touched them. 
literally it was um that was my thing i love going and shooting rabbits and stuff. Mm. <laughs> so did you used to eat them yeah was that mate, mate we survived off the land We're, um did she know this i think she must have re- it's a vicious circle because you starve the kids eventually they have to steal food and then you can beat them again so it's this vicious circle of she was always going to win. Um, so we started, like we had chickens, hundreds of freaking chickens and ducks and stuff. So we would very carefully take a chicken and kill it and make sure it wasn't noticed and stuff. Um, we had to, or we died, especially when we were living in the farmhouse and having to, we were kicked out the farmhouse and had to live in this old caravan, literally in the middle of the field. At that point, we did, you know, there's no electric in that caravan. There's in the middle of the winter, I would, it had like a little stove, I'd make a fire, and we survived around this little fire. Like, I would, when the vegetable, uh, when the vegetables were growing, I'd make sure I put some aside for us. And, you know, we lived off the land. Did you ever think about running? So my sister ran. Um, when, God, I'd have been about eight or nine. The police found her, brought her back. There was no investigation. She she must have told a really fucking good story. Like, she must have been really convincing to the police and stuff. Because I I actually went back to the farmhouse quite recently. Why? I don't know, mate. I'm fucking drawn to it. Closure? Yeah. But it's also, it's not far from where I live now. It's probably uh, 10 miles. Why did you move close to it? Do you think you're still connected to it all? Massively, massively. And it, it I freak- understand that. I get that. Yeah. It freaks my partner out because I, as I'm driving through that area, I'm like, that's my tree. That's like, and she's like, well, no, it's not anymore. Like, mm-hmm. she, doesn't, she doesn't quite get my relationship with it. You know, there's at the bottom of our land, there's this river and I can't stop going to that river because actually some of my happiest memories were swimming in that river. Like, so you had good memories as well? Mate, we had some great memories. Like, my favourite memories, looking back now, are... Oh, this sounds fucking weird. Waking up in a field with my dog, which was her dog, but I nicked it. Um, surrounded by deer off the hills, and there's a fog, mist, sunrise, and I'm just sat watching these stags. And what other kid gets to do that? So... In some ways, I you know I've done stuff other kids haven't got to do. Like I've caught fish in a river, like I actually had to eat them. Like for me, that's amazing. Like I, so I don't look back. I look back at the beatings as horrific. Don't get me wrong, and the drownings and the injuries, but the actual day to day living, I kind of miss that having to use your hands and like mm-hmm. survive. Yeah. Like I, I still at home now, I am more like we got the toddler. Um, and sometimes you have to stay in their bedroom, don't you? To mm-hmm. get them to freaking go to sleep. <laughs> uh, and I'll lay on the floor next to the bed. I am more comfortable laying on the floor than I am in my big mm-hmm. king size bed. I get it. Listen, I understand. I've interviewed a sniper. He was, world's longest sniper kill kill people it was in a war zone bombs kids dying women dying people dying but he's more at peace in a war zone than he is yeah. here so yeah. I, I totally understand and people might think that's fucking weird but you've got a mad connection to that love and hate yeah probably more hate but you've got a connection where you probably felt free at times as well because you're find, finding for yourself yeah I'm not a psychologist but i can only Give my opinion from the people. There's got to be some connection. Yeah, there's there, got like... to be some definite connection. Why you're still there and you've never, maybe you've never really had proper closure to it. What's the, how many scars and injuries have you actually got? I think they said I've got 143 scars. Uh, injuries, just ongoing, ongoing. Like most of 2019 I spent in hospital due to kidney injuries. Literally, most of 2019. Um, like you go back on my Insta, it's months at a time in hospital. Um, what started off as just a small complication, as they dug deeper and dug deeper, like 
the amount of physical abuse we had taken just means my body can't recover. Was she drugging you or giving you oh, alcohol? Oh, God, yeah, yeah. We were on fuck tons of drugs. What sort of drugs? So she was obsessed with the fact we had ADHD. Obsessed with the fact. And so she would go to multiple private doctors and get various prescription drugs. But she'd have like 10 different scripts for each of us. Um, so we were on Ritalin like five, six, seven times a dose a day. Um, the thing is, Ritalin's in the speed family. <laughs> and while giving him very small doses, does help kids, supposedly. When given at nine times a <laughs> dose, you're high as a fucking kite, mate. <laughs> like, I sometimes I miss that, that bit. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look back and go, oh, at least I got maybe, it free. That's why you stay so fucking close to it, bro. Yeah. Yeah. The good old good drunk times, days, mate. <laughs> just, just needed some happy trance music, mate, and I'd bring a light. Um, Obviously, it's fucked up, but it is I, fucked I, up. I laugh at the dark stuff because I think it is so fucked up. Yeah, I is. must be fucked up in the head because I think funny. It is because it's so mad. Yeah. Well, and you I'll, think I'll, that... t- I'll tell a chair leg joke at work. Yeah, you've got it too, man. And I'm sat there laughing my fucking ass off, yeah. and they're like, "What the fuck has entered the room?" Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm, but... I'm, I'm dark that way. When people die in funerals, I'm the, I'm the cat who's laughing. Yeah, it's nerves, and because I'm sad, and my laughter and jokes is because I have been broken. Yeah, nothing to your extent, but I've seen a lot of dark stuff and been through a lot of dark stuff with family members and friends and. The darkness of it, the laughter's the beautiful fucking sound of, I'm okay. Yeah. Laughing makes you feel okay. Yeah. That is the, it's cheese, it's the best medicine. If you as, as you get older, I, I don't tend to laugh as much as I used to because things become more serious. I became more professional. Yeah. I feel as if if I say certain things, people might take it out of context, but I just love that humour of yeah. dark humour, laughing, fucking taking the piss out of people myself. Yeah. It got me through my dark shit. I yeah. miss that, James, and I'm going to get him back, mate. Just just fucking laugh, mate. Just fucking make a joke of everything in, in life. But when, how, what was your daily routine like? So on the farm, wake up, 4 a.m. Um, depends if it was winter or summer. If it was summer, I'd wake up in the field, literally. Dog, amazing. Fucking. Ugh. What sort of dog? A big lab, but I'm talking a big lab. Yeah. I think it was mixed with a Rossi. I love. I've got a Rottweiler. Yeah, yeah. I so love, you know that big I love chest. Labs, yeah. He had that yeah, yeah, yeah. lab head, big Rottweiler body. Like I miss that dog so much. I can't tell you. I've got a fucking cockapoo now. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a fucking cockapoo now. <laughs> <laughs> with the white picket fence. Like. <laughs> oh, how times have changed. Yeah. But I miss. The, the relationship I had that dog, that dog kept me alive, mate. It would, in the winter, it would, mm. like, sit on my chest and keep me warm. Mm. Like, oh, I fucking miss that dog. Um, she had him put down in the end. Why? I think, just as the final, fuck you. He was only about eight or nine years old. It was perfect health. And then she claimed she couldn't, this was while the court case was going on, she claimed she couldn't look after him. So he was put down. I'm like, Fuck. Yeah, that for me, that's the one where I would have got the shotgun and yeah. blew her fucking head off. Yeah, that, fuck me, I, I, I that, was me. Yeah, that was my dog. Yeah, that was my dog. Me. Yeah, that, it's the love and the compassion, and they say men are more likely to stay alive for their dogs. Yeah, keep fat, keep like, the walking, the exercise, the love, that loving chemical. Yeah, just the purity of their smile and their happiness and yeah. their hard work as well, let's be honest. But oh, mine's a twat. It, yeah, it's, the, <laughs> it's just something where they never speak back, they never want to hurt you, they've always got your back, no matter yeah. what you do, no matter if you're in a cardboard box or a big mansion, your dog's sitting right next to you. Yeah. Through thick and thin, dark days, happy days, just dogs are the best thing on this planet. If everybody yeah. could be like a dog, the world would be the best place yeah. ever. I think they should be able to prescribe dogs. I don't for people who are struggling uh, not, yeah but not not in all seriousness because dogs could get hurt etc yeah of course but time with a dog is mm-hmm. incredible and it, that's still my go-to time like most evenings sunset dog and me in a field walking around that's still my reset mm-hmm. shit day take the dog out mm-hmm. when was it all coming to a head then were you not feeling as if you were getting stronger you could then handle yourself or were you just totally in fear or did this you're you thinking, okay, this is starting to change here where so, things can maybe 
So the daily beatings started to stop. Why? Um, because I think she started realizing we could probably kill her. Hmm. So she was still doing shock attacks. What's so, that? Well, coming around, hitting you with a baseball bat or something. So when you least expect it or pouring hot water over you when you're asleep or something. Yeah, it was things you couldn't predict. So you couldn't defend yourself from. Um, but as we came into late teens, we were starting to get antsy. <laughs> starting to get... Um, yeah, we we weren't as controllable. So Aloma, my other sister, she got dropped off in the middle of Bristol with a hundred quid. That was it. Women's I think she paid for a women's refuge, uh, like a YMCA or something for for a week, and that was it. She was done because Aloma I think was about to run away permanently. So for her to get some control on it, mm-hmm. she just dropped Aloma off. And who was that for you? Um, were you happy or sad on that very day? Quite happy because we'd had an argument. <laughs> I was mm. like, fuck you, get out of the car. Um, but it felt like our team had been broken up. It was like, yeah, we were proper threesome, and she'd split that. And then it was just me and Victoria left at that point. And you know, I didn't speak to Aloma. F- till the police got involved so it was like four years without any contact with my sister it's mad and then i'd started going a bit nuts um just running off randomly hiking like up the hills and she sent me off to live with her parents who only lived down the road but uh, her dad was very disabled so needed someone physically strong to like help move around the house and stuff so Actually, that was okay for me because there was no abuse. I got fed um, and I had a little bit more freedom. So this was the beginning of the end for me. And I thought, you yeah, know, I think she was going to do the same, drop me off somewhere, give me some money and send me on my way. And I was expecting that at any moment. Um, what I didn't realise is the police had started a very big investigation into Eunice that was going on in the background. I had no idea. How did they know? So Victoria was still going to church and she was in a wheelchair and Eunice never stopped abusing Victoria. Um, Like I'd got to the point she couldn't really beat me. I could walk away. (laughs) Um, Victoria's in a wheelchair. Yeah, because that's through the car crash. What what happened with the car crash? Car crash is fucked up, man. Car crash is fucked up. So we've been on a couple of holidays and I need to tell you about Florida after this. Florida's even more fucked up. But car crash, we were on the way back from Pontins, not the best place in the world, don't recommend. Two out of five. Uh, On the way back from Pontins, um, we're in different vehicles and there's massive traffic jams all the way. But we get back and they're not behind us and um Eunice starts ringing Judith her eldest daughter's phone no answer no answer and three four hours go by this traffic jam must be awful like if they're still stuck in it and then that police car pulls up outside the house and instantly I knew like I knew like doping accident something's happened and the police took Eunice into a room and must have told her there'd been an accident. Um, as she was walking out the house, I was like, what's wrong? What's wrong? She just blanked me, totally got into the police car and whizzed off. Um, the Jehovah's Witness community then took care of us that evening, uh, which was weird being in a normal bed in a normal house, like, um, eating food at a table for me. Um, and then the next day we got driven to French A Hospital in Bristol. And I, in my head, I'd been praying all night that everyone was all right. And then we're on our way to a hospital, so everyone must be all right. Um, Eunice takes us into a side room and just sits us down and goes, 
Charlotte and Judith are dead. And I wish it was you. That was it. And then just walked out. Like, so within five seconds, you've just been told your two sisters are dead. And also that <laughs> slap around the face as well. That and I, I wish it was you too. Like, what the fuck? What were you thinking then? Can you remember? I. Yeah, I can't really Do remember. Do you blame yourself for a lot of things? Oh God, I, I, I still blame myself for. I was meant to be in that car. I was meant to be where Charlotte was. Uh, it was only because I was. I kept arguing with my little brother that I wasn't in that car. Um, I would be dead. And I look back now and go, you know, don't get wrong, I'm happy to be alive, but mm-hmm. Charlotte, you know, Charlotte did nothing wrong. You know, Who was driving that car? So Eunice's real daughter, Judith. Did she know about the abuse? Yeah, 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 yeah. She joined in a few times. Nowhere near as bad as Eunice, but... Did they ever get charged? Oh, she's dead. Jesus. <laughs> She kill herself? No, no, no. She died oh, in the car crash. Fuck so. yeah, fuck sake. So yeah, I thought it was the other two. I thought it was sort of was her two daughters. <laughs> yeah, that's made by that. It's so fucked up, mate. And I, <laughs> like good riddance to the cow, then. <laughs> Fucking bitch. There, there is a bit of that. There is a bit of that. Do you know what I mean? If so, Charlotte died and Judith died. They were both in the front seats. And yeah, well, fuck her then. If she's abusing kids and torturing kids, then good, yeah. good riddance. She well, be doing... I, I also feel a bit bad. Are they fuse? Were they or or were they pressured into doing it? That's, which is different. Yeah, do you know what I mean? What or if I they're think... becoming, if they're just joining in for the sake of it and bullying and yeah, yeah. Again, I think she was under the spell. I yeah, think she yeah, was yeah, under yeah. the spell. Yeah, so nah, God rest her soul. Then, but um, how old was she? I think she was late twenties. Yeah, she's a young. Yeah. But did she? But then again, if she knows this was going on, she could have still spoke out. Yeah. and like she had, she had, she had a normal well. life. She could at any point, like. Gone out and hat. Oh, fuck her then again. Yeah. I take that back, mate. No <laughs> you flip flopped yeah, on this about five times. I wasn't that. sure. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I was showing the 19 I was she abused herself. But yeah. if she's out and she's, she knew about the abuse and she's, she never, again, it could be fear. You know yourself, you've done yeah. a statement, it retracted that. Yeah. So I understand. So I'll sit in the fence for that one. I take it back. I apologize. Rest your, God rest your soul. But, but if she's still abusing you, it's still hard to, yeah. I, to I, forgive. I, I look back now and she could have changed everything. Yeah. Multiple times. Like she worked in a normal job. She could have like, she knew what normality was and what this was. Mm -hmm. Whereas we didn't know what normality was. Yeah. It's different if she was just in that house. Yeah. And that's all she knew. Yeah. yeah. But she's in a normal job, look, caring people around that and then going to the torture chamber. Yeah. She knows. So there comes a time where you, you go, wait a minute. That's not normal. If she, if she was part of it as well, what sort of stuff did she get her daughters to do? Uh, so only her eldest daughter. Um, her younger daughter, Becky, um, she moved out at 18. She must, like, before we arrived. Um, and she had very little contact with Eunice. She, I think she knew how fucking nuts she was. And she actually ended up testifying against Eunice mm. in court. So fair play to her. Yeah, yeah. I like that. And we tried to keep a relationship after all this, but um, it's fucking weird. Isn't it? Let's be honest. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, people just want to kind of forget it yeah. and move on. And I think she's gone on and done her own things. Like she used to like come down and see us and stuff, and actually it was like we're just dragging your life through it. Yeah, so, bringing back all the emotion. Yeah, what are you talking about with Florida? What happened? So she took you away as well. Oh, Florida's fucked up. <laughs> I, keep, I keep saying everything's fucked That's up. It's all fucked up, mate. <laughs> Fuck it's pretty fucked up. Um, <laughs> so, okay. It's so, good you can lie. Like, if I, hey, fuck it, mate. It's, it's you got to laugh at the fucking it? nuts. Yeah. yeah. But Florida was the weirdest fucking thing ever because we did not get abused at all. So from the moment we arrived at Gatwick Airport, and flew business class, bougie, to Florida. We did net got no abuse. What age were you? Uh, I'd have been, it's 98, so I'd have been 10, 10, 11. But you were at that stage. Did you ever think about screaming or running, or were you just happy to go to Florida? Well, in my mind, I'm like, okay, we must be cleared of the devil. 
and this is our treat because she was hugging me at the airport um i actually had never flown long haul so i ended up shitting myself (laughs) as you do (laughs) i woke up oh shit i've shit myself um she lovingly dealt with that like no embarrassment like um cuddled up in the car like there was no abuse we were fed normally and we were in a villa in the middle of nowhere so she could have done carried on we went to theme parks all as a family uh we'd get all the photos afterwards we'd get toys florida was a dream we went to cape canaveral we went to a cruise we went you know we we were out there for fucking donkey's years and it was incredible she must have spent probably 100 grand out there don't know where she got the money from we still don't know that but you know probably the best holiday a kid could wish for everything but sea world swam with dolphins and all that shit and we're like this must be it you know it's over we land at the airport back home again business class very nice and still everything's fine we get home and someone's left the electric heater on for the like immersion heater in the tank and there's it's bubbled over a bit and caused a bit of damage we were beaten to within an inch of our life that day it's like how can you switch from perfect mum probably dream mum to evil again and the space of a flight why did she take these she didn't need to uh so uh charlotte always a, wanted to go but it's so a character for yeah that with all the stuff that you went through and then she's doing that but again it's a manipulation of loving at the airport because it's nobody will say anything it's, it's just yeah. manipulation tactics so so but she could have abused us abused us all throughout florida like we were litching a villa and we wouldn't have said anything let's be honest we were under the spell mm-hmm. um you know, she didn't have to spend hundreds of pounds on fancy restaurants for us. She could have just given us scraps at home. Was there ever any sexual abuse? Oh, God, yeah. Was there? Yeah. It's early years. Yeah. Um, I haven't really gone into that, but yeah, it, it, it got sexual at times. I, I don't know about my sisters, but, you know, it was pretty shit. <laughs> um, yeah, that's... It's fucked up. Part of me thinks there are there are days I can't remember in Florida, and part of me thinks that whole thing was a sexual abuse thing, and that's the reason she was being nice to us. Good she, well, she'd have friends over to the Florida house, and I, I personally think we were sexually abused on that trip, and drugged up to our eyeballs because we were being drugged up to our eyeballs on Ritalin and all sorts of sedatives and stuff. I think we were abused on that trip. And that's the reason we got taken over. But I have no, literally no proof of that. Pedophile ring. Yeah. That's just my personal opinion. Though I, I have literally no proof of that. But it was so out of character for us to be taken out of that abusive situation, suddenly dressed normally, dressed cute, yeah. and taken to this really nice villa. That's why I asked. Because yeah. that's so out of character. So for me, yeah. has she got money to take? And that was a lot of money. And they like. sent kids to fucking pedophiles where if you're drugged up all the time, you wake up, you don't know what the fuck's happened. Yeah. Yeah. And there were parties at that villa. I can't remember most of that. So, you know, I've, I've definitely got thoughts of what happened out there, but... I'm never going to be able to prove it. Is that easier for you, though? Just to not feel as if, well, maybe it did, maybe it didn't, but deep in, you don't really want to dwell on it, it too uh, much? If if someone ever presented me photos, I think that would break me again. Um, It's 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 almost better not knowing sometimes, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it depends. If I look cute in those photos, no, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, mate, I get it. Humor's your fucking defense, yeah, yeah, mate. Yeah, That's yeah. the thing that's kept you alive. Yeah. 
Same as myself. Never been through the extent you went through, but the humour. That's all we've got, man. Yeah. That's we can. It's we, the ultimate can, defense, but yeah. also it, it's, it's ultimate release as well. Yeah. Where we think, you know what? It was fucked up. I'm just going to laugh today. Yeah. You know what I mean? Some fucking scary dream comedy, dark fucking madness. But I get it. Listen, yeah. I get it, and I'll laugh with you not all, all day long. But no, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing. I get it, man. I just it, yeah. at the fucking madness, pure madness of it, because it is what it's an just, evil it's, bastard. It's, it's insanity, mate, and it. But. After that, then when did the shit hit the fan? When did it all come on top for her? Did she know this? Uh, so, and how did the investigation start? So they they started invest. Um, my sister kept going to church, covered in scars, uh, fresh scars, and a couple of members of that church stepped out of line and were like, "You've got to tell us what's going on. We know something's going wrong, and we're not going to let you go home until you tell us." So they stepped way out of the church's path and they probably suffered themselves for that. Victoria eventually broke down and told them some of it. And they were like, whoa, <laughs> this is fucked up. So they immediately called police. Police came and started investigating and put Victoria in a safe house. So Eunice knew this was coming because suddenly Victoria's disappeared. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses kind of lied and said she's just moved on because she's you know, 19, she can do that. Um, but I think Eunice knew the end was coming quickly. Of course, I'm down the road. I have no idea what's going on. No idea. So I decide one day to run away. And oh, mate, I stole a butcher's bike. Bike with a big basket on it. I'm fucking... I'm... I'm going i'm out mate i'm i'm outy uh, <laughs> so i later to find out jehovah's witnesses and the police this really upset their fucking plans that was going on so they all start hunting for me and uh i was found by a couple of jehovah's witnesses who happened to be the ones who were dealing with my sister and they start asking loads of fucking questions mate and I, I go with them because I'm like, I, I do need to go back. This is stupid. And that, and then suddenly the police arrive and they start like taking photos of my legs and stuff. And like, I'm like, I only ran away. Like, you know, it's all cool. And then loads of questions. So I end up going back to Eunice's parents. And then a couple of days later, shit hits the fan, mate. And I get that knock on the door. And they'd done a raid on our boat. They'd done a raid on both houses um some other properties it was massive they had a helicopter up and of course she was arrested for I think it was 29 charges or something crazy um i didn't know she'd been arrested i was just literally told policeman knocks on the door they sent a fucking dog man for me <laughs> they could, have, could have sent a nice like lovely soft police woman or something like no they sent the dog man for me he's, a, he's actually a really good friend of mine now um but yeah they sent the dog man and he knocks the door your mum's been arrested could you come with me i was like not today and close the door i was still half asleep <laughs> eventually i get the picture um i end up going to the police station for the first time and i denied everything mate i denied everything i'm sat there my little brother was had been put in the same car as me and we she'd always taught us like deny everything like because jehovah will protect you and all this shit um so yeah i denied everything and the police started making phone calls and like we're gonna go visit your sister who you haven't seen in ages victoria who was in a wheelchair so i'm like yeah yeah let's go do that um so we get taken to the hospital i'm like why is she in a hospital I get, um, I walk up to the child's ward. She's in there. I open the door and she gets out of her wheelchair and walks to me. This is someone who'd been paralyzed from the waist down since that car accident. And the fucking weird, horrible thing is Eunice had never let her get physio. And it turns out she wasn't paralyzed at all. Eunice just kept reactivating the injury. So this whole time, four years of her, five years of her life, she could have been walking. 
and Eunice saw compensation, didn't she? So, so your, they were in a car crash. Your sister, she had horrific was injuries, injured, don't... but the hospital says we'll keep her here for a couple of months to yeah. Give her food. She took her out early. Yeah, we'll get her treatment. We'll get her walking again. But she took her out early. Kept yeah. her in the wheelchair for three to four years to claim benefits. Yeah. And absolutely make the injuries worse because she can keep claiming. Yeah. That's so, evil to the ultimate. Yeah. That's next level shit. And that. don't get me wrong, Victoria had horrific injuries. She had like stomach removed with the bag and she had spinal injuries. She Every bone was pretty much fat. Yeah. The reason how she survived especially with the Jehovah's Witnesses, because they didn't want her to have blood transfusions. Mm -hmm. so, Why? Uh, so Jehovah's Witnesses don't like foreign blood going into our bodies, so they'd rather you die on the table than have a blood transfusion. It's, it's just a Jehovah's Witness thing, and it's fucked up. <laughs> so eventually the doctors overrode them. That is rare. That's happened like 10 times in this country. So rare. Um, and she survived. But... Yeah, she she walked to me, mate. She fucking walked to me, and that at that point my world came crashing down because everything I'd known to that point was a lie. Yeah. Is seen, that is that when it all sank in that what yeah. you'd actually been through in life? What age were you? I would have been sixteen. So still young adult. Yeah. Well, imagine we're sixteen men physically, mentally, we probably. Yeah, he's still kids because he's missed school. And could you read yeah. or write? Uh, we taught ourselves to read and write. So Loma was the only one who could read and write, and she taught us to read and write. So we'd never had any education. So what was it like when she got charged and you had to go to court? Was so, it still all a kind of blur? Was it like a dream nightmare? So court, a lot of shit had gone on in between. Like we went to foster care again and learning to live again. Very weird, mate very weird having to start getting education medical care i'd never had an injection in my life so having to catch up on all the things kids have and just madness um and so much main medical issues to sort by the time the court yeah, it's two long years by the time the court case rolls around and the police were slowly preparing us they took us to the court to view it and all that shit it still doesn't prepare you for walking into that court knowing you're going to have to tell your story. And it's you versus them. You know, you can have all the evidence in there, but in your head, you're like, what happens if they don't believe me? Like, and we were behind a curtain. I'm the fucking Muppet who walked in the room early, didn't I? So I ended up seeing her and she's just staring at me, staring at me. That freaked me out. That freaked me out. Um, I, I found giving evidence really hard. Um, I kept getting angry. I kept getting really angry. Like when they'd ask a question, it was almost like a personal attack. So I'd be cross-examined and it just felt like a personal attack all the time. As an 18-year-old dealing with a lot of anger issues at that point, I just more to kill the fucking QC. Um, but, you know, eventually she... Uh, she pled not guilty to everything, so we had to go through all the court. And they found her guilty on everything, literally everything. Um, and she got sentenced to 14 years, which I believe was the longest child abuse sentence given in the UK, which is stupid, isn't it? Um, the judge said it was the worst case he'd ever dealt with in his life and gave the maximum he was allowed um, but of course, in this country, you serve seven, don't you? Did she not get a sentence reduced? Uh, yeah, and she got two years removed. Why? Um, they argued over one charge or something, so the court let her remove two years. How was that feeling going through all the court cases and all the statements, retracting straight statements? Did you ever feel as if you were making it all up in your mind? And yeah, how was yeah, it yeah, all yeah. the feeling? And you start doubting yourself, or did I remember that correctly? Like, or, you know, um, and you're thinking, well, maybe this is what every family is like. You know? So, you know, am I taking this too far, etc.? I tried to pull out the court case multiple times. Um, I tried to get a criminal record because I knew if I got a criminal record, I couldn't 
testify easily. I'd have been a slanted witness, so they'd have removed me. That's credited. This is it. So I stole my foster parents' car and drove it to Cardiff. Uh, I had a way over time, no license at the time or anything, but I'd been taking lessons and drove the car. Then felt really fucking guilty. So put no oil in it, washed it and waxed it and put it back on the drive. <laughs> and the foster parents were just so happy to see it again that they didn't press charges. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, all oh, that fucking effort. <laughs> see, when she got a guilty those, did it, was that a sense of relief that, well, wait a minute, everything that we went through wasn't normal and you were happy or did you feel sorry for her? When she got sentenced to guilty, I was at work. And I was in staff canteen and it came up on the news. Did people know it was you? So certain staff did. I'd kept quite quiet about it, to be honest, but certain staff did, my management and stuff. And I remember it it didn't sink in for me until a colleague the other side of the room, a lady, she just went, that fucking cow got what she deserved. And that was the moment where actually it kind of, just that little comment, I don't know, it just was like, oh shit, it's over, isn't it? It was, it was exactly what I needed at that point. Mm -hmm. And, but then as you know, the media starts and suddenly you're... Flavour of the week. Yeah, yeah. And then the real mental issues start because... In some ways, you've been distracted by that court case. So for two years, you haven't had to deal with the emotions and stuff. And suddenly, everyone's asking your story. Yeah, James. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just bringing back your pain and misery, mate. I'm at, you were actually doing fine before you done this interview. I've just sent you back 10 years. <laughs> the pain just ends in a minute, the guys. <laughs> for content, isn't it? Using everybody's misery for my own gain, mate. <laughs> sorry, man. Sorry. But, um, yeah, as you say, your flavour of the week yeah. and having press follow you. I wasn't. That was weird. The sun, man. The sun do some weird shit. They're ruthless. <laughs> they really are. Did they benefit you, though? Did it, was it positive for you? Or did any of them try and blame you? Um, it was all positive. All positive. Um, no one had an angle <laughs> on me, um, thankfully, because I don't know mentally how to dealt with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, it, it was it was intense. And then at that point, I'd also met my real family, my real mum and dad came back into the picture. And were initially they, they tried. Were they clean? No. Oh. No. They were, they tried, mate. They tried. Uh, Is I've that got, because they seen you on TV? Did they remember who you were? Well, so no, social got involved. Uh, so social them. were like, you've got real parents. Did they ever try and reach out They when you were with her? They said they had. I, I don't know. I don't know. I try and not think on that one too much. I think they could have done a lot more. But addictions are it's a horrible thing. It, it is a horrible thing. Yeah. And it you know, they tried, bless them. But and it's heartbreaking to think that that's where the abandonment kicks in. Was yeah. I not good enough? Was I some sort of fucked up kid? Was I what yeah. was I in my previous life? I don't know how you think, but people look into all these angles and they blame themselves how horrible a kid yeah. was I that my mum and dad fucking didn't want us. But when you, if they've got addictions and stuff, you don't even know their backstory where yeah. the shit that they've maybe been through. But it's hard, man. Every parent should do everything they can to protect yeah. their kids. And I, I, we I, can I, see that now because we're yeah, the shit that we're through. And I'm in a good place now, but it's just the way it is. And what was it like seeing them for the first time? Was Mate, there a I, did, of, I didn't want to see them. Was there anger? Yeah, mm. proper anger. So my brother... They're, they're a weird couple, mate. My mum was like 30 stone and my dad was about seven stone. So it, it was fucking weird to see. Him. Still with each other? Yeah, yeah. They'd stayed with each other for for donkey's years. Did they have any other kids? Uh, Not so yes and no. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I think they'd let kids go before us. Um, And I've tried to make contact with those kids, but... um. We've decided actually that's their life, that's ours. Let's keep it apart. Um, but yeah, meeting them for I struggled with that. I yeah, why the fuck are you coming back into my life now? You could have 
you know, help me all this time. Uh, my brother loved them. Brother went full in. So I kind of stayed around for him yeah. and dealt with them. And then I did grow a relationship with them. But it was a, it was not the right relationship, mate. Like They bought me a gram of Coke for my 18th birthday. Like, <laughs> it was good Coke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why you kept going back, <laughs> fuck's sake. <laughs> Sat in here all innocent, mate. You liked your drugs, mate, I tell you that for much. <laughs> I, I, I don't regret any of the drugs I tried. That would have gave you a gram of gear. That's yeah. all they knew. Yeah. They probably think they're actually being yeah. good. And that's the yeah. sad reality. That is the sad reality. But they and don't then, see the and destruction. And then I ended up with, I wrote a book, and I ended up with some real money. What so, is the book? So the book is Child C mm-hmm. by Christopher Spry. Um, available all good retailers. Yeah, and listen, <laughs> man, we're here for business as well. Where can people buy your book? People will be um, so So engrossed. Amazon's the best place. Yeah, Amazon's I'll leave the link in the description and stuff, Thank man. You, man. So listen, like I say, man, get make your money out of the misery. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so how was it writing the book? Um, so I find it quite easy. So a lot of people say it's therapeutic. Yeah. Like, I'm sure you've interviewed lots of people. It's like, oh, writing is therapeutic. I just found it annoying. I just wanted to get it over and done with as quick as possible so I could get my last check. Um, I, I I was in a bad place where I was starting to go down drink, alcohol, drink, alcohol. Drink drugs. Yeah. And my parents weren't helping with that. And suddenly, it's only years later, I realised about 40 grand I wasted on them trying to buy their love. Did they come back for financial gain? I don't think they did. But they rode the financial gain train very well. Addicts will do that. Yeah. And, you know, I bought I bought myself a nice watch, uh, a nice tag. And my dad was like, oh, that's fucking nice. So I'm like, oh, he needs one. So I went and bought him a tag. There was none of that. No, son, like, this is fucking stupid. Like, keep your money, invest Ga- it. Gavens. It was, thanks, son. Should we go out for dinner? <laughs> I didn't know it was on me. Um, yeah. I wasted so much money. And if I look back at an adult head now, like they, they took advantage of me. I don't know if they even knew they were doing it. But yeah, they did take advantage of me. Did you ever get therapy? Um, very recently. So I'll, I'll tell you as a dad, it's hearing a baby cry really fucked with my head. To the point I had to walk out the room. Um, so very recently I accepted actually there's something not yeah you know, there's something I need to get right with that. So I went to a specialist, did some courses with her, helped me tons, helped me literally tons to the point you know a few sessions in I could deal with him crying, and yeah that's the first time I've ever really needed therapy. I did try general counselling a few times, but. Mate, I ended up cancelling them, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and and also like I don't like I tell my story with a bit of comedy. Yeah, of course. It's, it's pretty it's fucked you up. Right, yeah. You can't do that in counselling, can you? Mm-mm. And why are you laughing? Yeah. Take uh, me back to that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And like, not you end up crying. Just let me laugh. It gets me through. So you take away that humour makes me feel vulnerable. Yeah. I didn't want to feel vulnerable, so I started like not going to these sessions. And yeah, I, I've managed to cope mostly on my own. Yeah, I, like I say, you've got a good spirit. Everything yeah. that you've came through, and I, I think that's what keeps you alive. Yeah, taking stripping all that back and trying to listen. We've got to face the problems to heal. Yeah, that's a given. But there comes a times where we have got to flip the chapter, and then yeah. sometimes the more you tell the story, the more it doesn't actually have that meaning. Yeah, so you can't you, that. Can, that sicky connection where you actually just laugh at how fucked up it was and how yeah. messy it was. Yeah. How was it then the last few years to been getting on with it and telling your story? It's out there in the public domain. How's it? Is it be it, easier? It's it's easier, and I I never knew it was going to have the reaction with other victims. I never saw that coming. Never saw that coming. So the first time I ever told my story uh, on the this morning actually with Schofield. Uh, oh, <laughs> he's really That's, sure <laughs> i'm just going to put it that way he's really sure uh we won't talk about philip Schofield. um 
he did some no I'm joking <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't pretty yeah, enough yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but I my Facebook had just come around properly back then and the first time I told that story I got flooded by other victims who weren't ready to tell their story or weren't ready to go to the police but just needed to tell someone mm -hmm. I wasn't ready for that that was 1300 messages in a day of different victims and it's been ev like that ever since so now there's a few of us who every time you know once this podcast goes out there will be reaction from other victims you're welcome and that's the reason i do it it's one to raise awareness that this type of thing can happen to everyone so we should be vigilant and two like tell your story like seek justice you know yeah or if they just need someone to chat to and tell them actually the thing you're feeling now that's normal like the shit you went through wasn't right mm -hmm. whatever stepdad says that isn't okay like how common is it here because your story it seems it's got an american american touch to it but i'm not yeah. i'm not saying every americans are like that but that's the kind of documentaries and series i see yeah. it's the kind of american families who do that sort of torture it's... i had an amazing man on stephen smith years ago it was one of my first ever podcast he was a boy in the cellar yeah locked him in the basement for 13 years tortured them didn't yeah. know so it's got uh, how common is it here in the uk so extreme cases quite rare or mm -hmm. that we know of extreme cases like that actual I'd say the main thing I come across is kids witnessing domestic abuse. We've got a massive problem in the UK with that. Yeah. And that domestic abuse spills to the kids. And that's what most of my emails are about. Um, and they're really hard to read, mate. I'm not going to lie. And a lot of, you know, uncles molesting mm kids and stuff yeah, like that so i i very rarely get a physical abuse email it's mainly sexual and domestic abuse which are all fucking wrong yeah. like how was it becoming a father did you ever worry that you could have turned out to be like her 100 percent, 100 percent. and the the weird thoughts you know when coming up to the pregnancy and stuff um yeah, am I worthy of having a kid? Am I capable of having a kid? Like, um, head of Gloucester Social Services once told me, abused kids abuse. Thanks, mate. <laughs> How can they say that? Not everyone, not every kid who gets sexually abused or physically abused then becomes the same. It does no. happen. Listen, a big it, it does happen, yeah. Does, but yeah. That's why I asked the question, did you ever think? But I think every man thinks they're never good enough or can they, are they yeah. ready to be a dad? That's the, the, natural. They're actually normal things. Yeah, for... yeah, but because of your circumstances and the stuff... You start overthinking Yeah, it would yeah. enhance that paranoia. Yeah, and there's a lot of... I'll tell you what, you know, toddlers fall down all the time. Yeah. And he had a little bruise on his elbow. And I was paranoid. Everyone's going to think, um, I've abused my kid. And this was the first day I'm dropping him off for nursery. I'm like, everyone's going to think I'm abusing him. Everyone's going to think. As I walked through the door, the kid that ran towards me was covered in bruises. I'm like, actually, this is normal, isn't it? Uh, yeah, kids are always falling. <laughs> this this is it. And actually, he's the most freaking clumsy little bastard ever. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but I was paranoid people had judged me based on my passing. Actually, it doesn't happen. But in my brain... Of course, but but every man, like I'm probably female, we get yeah. paranoia, but with your circumstances, so it's you can people can understand that. Yeah. How was it? Because she's free now. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. How was that feeling? Did that? Did you ever want to reach out? Or how? So how did... I've never wanted to reach out, but I know Victoria, who sadly is dead now. Um, she killed herself. She killed herself. Yeah, quite recently. Um, she did want to reach out. But she was also terrified of her at the same time. Victoria never let go. Victoria could never let go of move on from that situation. And, and that was your sister? Uh, she wasn't my real sister. Step but sister? She, yeah. That was her daughter? Uh, adopted. So, yeah, legally her daughter. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, but she was getting abused before you, Victoria. A lit, uh, yeah, for about a year before we arrived. Yeah. So, you know, Victoria, she, Victoria probably had the worst set of cards played because she was in the car accident. She's in a wheelchair. She's got all those internal injuries. Um, I think she became addicted to uh, prescription drugs, trying to deal with that constant pain. As you know, that's a slippy fucking slope. Right, so, yeah. um, they were giving her fentanyl and all sorts of yeah. horrific drugs. And that was a very hard day because we'd actually, we kind of had a love-hate relationship. Every time we met, we ended up talking about Eunice. So we didn't meet anymore. I knew where she was. I kept tabs on her, but that sounds terrible. <laughs> it's a bit spy-like. Um, but we didn't have that day-to-day -day interaction because actually we would friction based on our past. But having that police car drive up to your house, for one, it reminded me of... The charge? Yeah. But having that police car drive it to the house and it's the way they walk up to your door. You just know. No, something's not right. Yeah. Now, I expected it to be my dad, who is still alive. Um, my mum isn't anymore. But um, so when he said, um, your sister has died, I, it was shocking. It was shocking. And like, How did she end her life? Uh, she hung herself, mate. Out of all the ways to go, it's like. Why did she want to meet her? I don't know. I don't know. She She had many. Like she went on record saying she was terrified that Eunice was in within twenty miles, but then also she'd write a Facebook comment like, um, you know, uh, calling her mum still and stuff. And she struggled, she struggled, and I don't think she really got the help because no one knew how to deal with her. Like these cases aren't popular enough, thank God, <laughs> that this training for it you know mm -hmm. no one really knew how to deal with her she had an amazing partner who did everything for her and he was the one who found her and it's like what about the women who's abused you your whole life and tortured you and you and your brothers and sisters she get 14 years sentence reduced to 12 she's out now what would you do if she ever apologized i i don't ever think she would with her. No, i don't i don't think no, she ever would what if she did it, I would always mistrust it. I, I wouldn't believe it. Yeah. And yeah, I'd be like, it's bullshit. You said you seen her. At, what was it like? What was that feeling? So this was quite recent. This was uh, May. Um, I saw her. I rolled at a petrol station, went to fill fuel, and she was just walking out of the petrol station. And like, oh, fuck. <laughs> she didn't see me. Uh, or we didn't make eye contact or anything. Um you know, I've got a crazy colleague who was like, should have stabbed her, mate. Should have stabbed her in the eyeballs. And I'm like, actually, I don't even hate the woman anymore. It's like, she's nothing to me now. It, it, I'm at that point in my brain where I've, I've let go of it all. There's, yeah. no, there's no real anger there anymore. But that's a good thing. I think if you hold on to that anger, it eats away you like yeah. a poison. And that's a strong position to be in yeah. to then let go and actually... Because I've, been, I've spoke about it a few times. I had Jeff Thompson on, who's one of the most ruthless men on the planet. He's a ninth dan, martial arts expert. And his karate instructor abused him when he was 11 or 12. And he always had the thoughts of killing him. Mm. He became a bouncer. He was ruthless. And then he became a martial arts expert. But this guy's a stone-cold killer. Yeah. He's fucking ready to go. And when he'd seen his abuser in the, the cafe, he froze. He froze. Still had that power. But he yeah. said to him, this is what you've done. And then he, that day he got his power back. So you've yeah. seen how that, that petrol station kind of just gives you your power back. Yeah, I, it was definitely closure for me. Mm -hmm. It was like... Where do you go forward for the future, brother? Um, Book two. No, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. Listen, make money from the misery, mate. <laughs> Fucking... I, I, because it, it, as sad as it is, and it's also a positive, but people love these stories. Yeah. It makes their life go away at minute, my life ain't yeah. fucking bad. It actually makes people happier for yeah. some reason. People still feel sad and sorry for... The victims we get it, but it actually makes people well. It makes them realise what yeah. the fuck if I got to, to Mona. To be honest, I would even release it for free. No, that, don't uh, do that, mate. You've got no, to no, no, your but, worth. But um, a lot of people use my first butt as proof that you can get through it. Yeah. 
So that's the, you know, that's the reason I'm here. Like, you know, you're lovely to me and all that, but <laughs> <laughs> at least I got one compliment, mate. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's about raising awareness and about showing that actually you, you can go through all that and actually you can make it to normality. You've just got to like put the right yeah. steps in place. That's like I say, these sort of stories will, it helps survivors, it helps people come forward yeah. and that's a strength. You need to listen to this. So they I sometimes, but you would get them more constant because you've lived it. People are looking for answers and I get yeah. out where you then become at the forefront to say, well, this is what I get through. And I've interviewed a lot of survivors and the, you can see the destruction in their eyes. The, yeah. So but you've still got it together with the laughter and, and it's an amazing thing to see. So I'm proud of you for everything that you're Thank doing you, and man. try to do. For anybody that's maybe going through what you went through, the abusive relationship or they're, they're just because we've got social media now so people can sort of reach out yeah but how, what if anybody was struggling in, in that sort of environment what advice would you have for them um talk because um the main thing is if you keep it all bottled up it's it's gonna fucking kill you eventually it's gonna end you um you know it doesn't have to be the police it doesn't have to be um yeah even just even call Samaritans or something just talk it out um, but I would, I'd also say everyone, in, everyone should have a shot at justice. I'm massive for that. And I, I think all the, you know, if, if you don't deal with these abusers, they'll just go on to abuse other people. So I think you're doing yourself an injustice if you don't go out and get justice for what's happened to you, but also just keep your chin up. Keep your chin up. There is a future after abuse. And, you know, if you're going through abuse now, please seek help. But if you've had abuse in the past, like, you know, there is a future. Can I say, boy, would you like to finish up on anything else? That's me. <laughs> What's your social medias and stuff for people to maybe get in contact? Um, we'll drop them below because I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think my Instagram's Christopher dot Spride okay. eighty eight. That's the boy. Listen, nothing <laughs> Thank but you very much, love and respect for you, brother. I wish you all the best for the future. God bless you. Thank you.